In 2009, two park rangers approached retired police detective David Politis and told him a troubling story. They explained that in the years that they had been involved in numerous search and rescue operations at several national parks, they had witnessed an unsettling trend they didn't understand. They explained that when a person went missing, a massive search and rescue operation would ensue, accompanied by widespread press coverage. But after the first week or so, searches abruptly stopped and coverage was halted with no explanation or resolution. The conversation bothered David enough that he began to look into this behavior himself. And when he hit a brick wall with the authorities, he decided to do his own research. But what he discovered shocked him. People of all ages had been disappearing from national parks and forests at an alarming rate for decades, many under very similar circumstances, and David's investigative instincts told him this was a story that needed to be told. So, over a period of eight years, he studied over 1,200 disappearances and compiled a missing 411 series of eight books and one documentary documenting his findings. During the course of his studies, he has uncovered a number of reoccurring profile points that appear to link all the unexplained disappearances. Here we'll look at those traits and correlate them to just a few of the many mysterious cases David has highlighted. In anticipation for his new incredible documentary, Missing 411, The Hunted. How can you think about it? Oh, I think about it quite often. You know, always pops into your mind. All of a sudden, the woods went to this dead quiet. Robbie called me that night and said, Daddy's missing in the woods, but don't worry, we'll find him. The jeep was there. There was no man. But he should have been back by then. He should have been there. Something different than I never heard before in the woods. The FBI, according to their protocol, doesn't search for missing people. So do you understand why they were there? I thought they were there to provide some sort of technological support, but I don't didn't have any contact with them myself. Hmm. Have you ever had them on a search that you've done? No. We did find the pelvis partially buried, a thin jacket. Any there pants? Were... Pants? No. Socks? No, because we didn't find any feet. No feet? Right. This all doesn't add up to me. Nope. Oh. It just, none of it makes any sense. The point of separation. David discovered that when a person disappeared whilst in close proximity to friends or family members, it's usually when they have either gone off on their own for a moment, or strayed behind when trekking in a line, or gone ahead when fronting a trek. The point of separation might only be a few yards, but it seems long enough for them to disappear into thin air. Time. The time the majority of the victims David has investigated vanished is not in the middle of the night as you might expect, but rather mid to late afternoon when it's still daylight. Boulders. Many of the found victims of disappearances are discovered near granite or rock fields, often next to or surrounded by boulders. Water. Victims are either found or disappear near water without any evidence that they've fallen in or drowned. Weather incidents. At the time a person goes missing or during the search, it's been noticed that a sudden onset of extreme weather ensues, either in the form of snow, dust or rainstorm or the sudden emergence of thick mist or fog. Disability. Many of the victims have an obvious or not so obvious disability or illness prior to their disappearance. Canines unable to trace. One of the first things search and rescue do when a person is reported missing is send out a specially trained dog to track their scent. In 95% of the cases David has studied, 
dogs have been unable to find a single scent, or if they do, they quickly lose and just lie down. Missing clothes or shoes. In many cases, for whatever reason, the victim has removed their shoes and items of clothing. This is also the case when missing people are found alive. They either have missing clothing or clothing they do not recognize or have traveled several miles without shoes. Now we know removing clothing can be a trait of someone suffering from exposure. However, it is unlikely that is the cause as they would not travel the great distances they do, so it doesn't really add up. Unknown cause of death. In the cases David has studied, when a missing person is found dead, the cause of death can either not be determined or does not correspond with how the victim was found. Geological clusters. David has discovered that people go missing in clusters in certain areas, and there is no reason for these places to be any more dangerous than anywhere else. The clusters range from three in the same vicinity to up to 80. He also realized this was not just in the US either. It was the same for areas in Canada, the UK, Australia, and seven other countries, all with missing persons following the same profiles as those mentioned. Also, none of the disappearances could be attributed to animal attacks, as when this happens, there is almost always clear evidence left behind. David also discovered that there are an inordinate amount of genius level people disappearing, such as doctors, scientists, etc., as well as people with extensive knowledge of the back trail who simply wouldn't normally get lost. As a former police detective, one of the things that perplexed David the most was that the park service kept scant or no records of park disappearances, and there is no national database or list for the victims, and no follow-up procedure. It seemed that after the initial week or so of intense searching, that was it, leaving families to conduct their own searches and left in limbo with no definitive answers and no closure. Through the missing 411 books, the profile of hundreds of missing person cases has been raised and has brought to the public's attention the frequency and mystery surrounding these disappearances. Let's take a further look and start at the beginning and examine the very first case that David Politis investigated. Stacy Arras. On the 25th of July, 1981, 14-year-old Stacy Arras from Saratoga was on a horse riding trip with her father, George, and seven others. After riding for a few hours, they stopped at some cabins at Sunrise High Sierra Camp, with a group plan to freshen up and stay the night. Stacy showered and changed clothes, and then told her dad she was going for a walk to stretch her legs and take some photographs. One of the group, an elder man named Gerald Stewart, was sitting on a boulder about a hundred feet away, and Stacy indicated to her dad that was the direction she was heading. The last conversation she had with her dad related to her footwear, when he advised her to change her flip-flops to hiking boots. The rest of the group all witnessed her walking towards the boulder where Gerald was sat, and as she approached him, she told him that she was going to walk to the nearby lake. Gerald said he would accompany her, but after just a short time, he felt tired and sat down. The rest of the group were close enough to see this and confirm it happened. They also watched Stacy leave Gerald and walk alone towards the lake until she was eventually out of sight behind the trees. This was the last time anyone saw her. When Stacy didn't return, Gerald was concerned and made his way back to the cabins, but they could find no trace of Stacy so search and rescue were brought in. They questioned others in the area who had come from the direction Stacy had walked, but none of them had passed her. A huge search ensued, involving over a hundred people, helicopters, and sniffer dogs. The search was concentrated over a three to five square mile area around Sunrise Lakes. However, despite these efforts, the only thing they ever found was the lens cap off her camera. Given there was no evidence of an animal attack, and because she was so close to the camp, it seemed very unlikely she lost her way. At the time, everything pointed to an abduction, although there was also speculation that Stacy had family and school troubles and was missing her boyfriend. But if she intentionally intended to disappear, why was she originally wearing such inappropriate footwear? And why did she ask two separate people to accompany her? None of it made sense. 
30 years after Stacy's disappearance, David looked at the case, and he requested the file on Stacy's disappearance from the National Park Service. This is a standard request, and not something that should be denied according to the Freedom of Information Act. However, on this occasion, the request was rejected. He later received a call from a special agent for the Park Service, asking him why he needed the information. This in itself is a violation of the Freedom of Information Act, as any citizen can ask for any federal file, and the government cannot question why. The agent told David, in no uncertain terms, that he could not have the case file. He also clearly stated that there were no suspects in the case, and it was still classified as a missing person. But when David challenged him about why the case was not listed in the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, he said he didn't believe that it wasn't. The reason he gave for not granting access was in case it turned into a criminal investigation. Despite previously stating, there were no new leads and no suspects. After all, the case was 30 years old and the main witness was long dead. The whole thing seemed highly irregular and got David wondering, was there something in the file they wanted to be kept hidden? David persisted in his request for the file, but was repeatedly denied. What David also found troubling about the case was the decision to stop searching for Stacy after just nine days. This seemed bizarre when you think Stacy must have been in that park somewhere. It's not like when a child is taken off the street and can be taken hundreds of miles away in just a few hours. The terrain in the park would restrict anybody from getting very far, let alone a 14-year-old girl. People don't just disappear off the face of the earth without leaving some trace. Even if they had been eaten by an animal, there would have been evidence, so calling off the search so early seemed odd. Unless, of course, authorities already knew what had happened to her, and further searching was futile. David also discovered there had been three more bizarre disappearances very close to the vicinity Stacy disappeared. On the 9th of August 1968, a man's body was found in a crevice at Tenia Peak, just over a mile away from where Stacy disappeared. The man has never been identified. On the 25th of May 1976, just over a mile away from the location of the unidentified man, 25-year-old Jeff Estes disappeared. Not a fragment of evidence has ever been found of him. On the 15th of July 1988, half a mile northeast of where the unidentified man was found, Timothy Barnes disappeared close to Polydome Lake. As with Jeff, not a shred of his evidence was found. The anomaly is the Stacy Arras case was just the start. Ronald Kirk Let's take a look at a case where a man went missing and the area was searched and then he turned up in that exact same spot weeks later. On January the 16th, 2012, 46-year-old Ronald Kirk sent text messages to friends, letting them know he was going hiking in Calico Basin in Red Rock Canyon, Nevada. Ronald, a former Marine, was no stranger to the basin. He was a keen runner, and he had hiked for long stretches in the canyon dozens of times before, often by himself, so the text wasn't unusual, and none of them would have been concerned. But when Ronald hadn't returned after several days, friends and family became worried. They went to the area where they found his red jeep still sitting in the parking lot. They organized a search and alerted authorities. Hundreds of fellow hikers on the ground and helicopters in the air spent hours and days searching for Ronald, but found nothing, not a trace. They scoured several trails and the route he was likely to have taken, but eventually the search was called off. Almost two months later, Ronald's remains were stumbled upon in a rocky area with established trails, not far from one of the Red Rock's most popular challenges, Turtlehead Peak. This same area had previously been extensively searched by the on-the-ground team, dogs and helicopters, using infrared technology, but none had located Ronald. The official explanation for not finding the body was slightly contradictory. It said Ronald's body was not obscured in any way, but it blended in with the colour of the surrounding terrain. The cause of death was not confirmed, although foul play was not suspected. 
In cases like these, David is not apportioning any blame on the search and rescue, as they do a fantastic job. He is merely pointing out the profile that fits with similar disappearances. In this case, we have an experienced hiker, the area previously searched and found nothing, unknown cause of death, boulders, and canines couldn't locate when apparently hidden in plain sight. George Penker. This next case is again a complete vanishing. On Friday, June the 17th, 2011, George Penker, age 30, went hiking with a group of 80 people from his church and one of 20 who were walking the upper trail that day. When they reached the top, they were separated with individuals hiking back down at their own pace. So in effect, they were in a string and George was likely at the back. However, at the time, his friends hadn't realised that, and it wasn't until much later they realised he was missing, and didn't report it until 9pm that night. George had a small amount of food and water on his person, so they were hopeful he would be found. A search was mounted straight away that intensified the next morning, and over a hundred search and rescue personnel were deployed, including dogs, helicopters, and ground searchers. But after nearly a week of searching, park rangers did not find any clues as to George's whereabouts. Absolutely nothing. And in the last eight years, not a bag, bone, or item of clothing have been found. Sadly, George has joined the long list of unexplained vanishings, and once again, George's case fits the following profile. Point of separation, no canine scent, geographical cluster, near water, Search not continued after a week. Jared Atadiro. This last case is probably the most well known and sadly involves a very young child named Jared Atadiro. Saturday, October the 2nd, 1999, was a gorgeous day in the mountains of Colorado, and Alan Atadiro and his children, three year old Jared and six year old Jocelyn, were at the Powder River Resort owned by Alan and his twin brother, Arlen, and the children were excited about going on an excursion to the nearby state fish hatchery with members of the Christian Singles Network group, of which newly divorced Alan was a member. Initially, Alan was reluctant to let little Jared go, but when the group reassured him that they were going to the hatchery, he agreed. The 11 members of the Christian group, along with Jocelyn and Jared, decided to take an early afternoon hike up the Big South Trail, 15 miles west of the resort. It is believed the group split into slow and fast groups. The trail was 11 miles and 8,440 feet up in the rugged Comanche Peak Wilderness, so not really suitable for a small boy. About 1.5 miles up the trail, Jared ran ahead of the group and talked to two fishermen who were surprised to see the child so far apart from the rest of the group. They last saw Jared walking rapidly up the trail, although it was unclear whether Jared was between the two groups or ahead of the faster group when he met them, but it's believed they were the last people to see Jared before he disappeared. Later, some members of the party reported hearing a scream. Jocelyn also heard this, but thought it was a playful scream rather than a frightened one. Eventually the group realised Jared was missing and began searching for him, and two of the members returned to camp and told Jared's father. Search and rescue were called after Alan realised the seriousness of the situation, although rescuers were convinced they would find him hiding somewhere. However, by the next morning, there was still no sign of Jared. After a helicopter refuelling, the search continued, but the helicopter seemed to be struggling with its new fuel load and the mountain conditions and it stalled and came down. Miraculously, all four crew members survived, although one was seriously injured. The crash alerted the media to the location and the place was swarming with reporters. And with worsening weather conditions, the search effort had become a media spectacle. As the search stretched into the third day, searchers combed riverbanks and steep slopes and dive teams were called in to search the slow moving river, but turned up nothing. Psychics even got involved, and all number of well-meaning people joined in the search. Theories as to what happened to Jared were rife, and anything from being killed by a predator, abducted by aliens, or falling in the river was suggested, along with other outlandish conspiracy theories. Human abduction was ruled out, as the time frame was too short, 
and they couldn't have got out without being seen, as there was just one way out of the narrow canyon. But with the trail growing colder, the sheriff's office met with Alan and his family, and made the difficult decision to call off the official search after a week. Four years later, in June 2003, three hikers in the Big South Trail area stumbled upon a white Tarzan tennis shoe in a taller slope 500 feet above the trail. They then found the other shoe, a brown fleece jacket and blue sweatpants, turned inside out. The hikers instantly knew what they had discovered. The next day, searchers combed the area and found remaining clothing, and 11 days later, they found a tooth and a skull. DNA confirmed the remains were of little Jared. Apparently, search and rescue never made it up to the 9,120 foot elevation where Jared's skull and tooth were found. Additional tests revealed little about Jared's cause of death, but it's widely believed he was attacked by a mountain lion, and his death certificate reads, undetermined, probable mountain lion attack. But the truth is, no one really knows how Jared died, and he has been added to the 411 missing list because of the profile of his disappearance. Point of separation, time, weather, water, no canine scent, Another thing that has always puzzled David is when a hunter or an experienced trailman goes missing. These are the sort of people who know all the pitfalls of hunting and camping, and are among the best prepared people who go out in the forest. So technically, it should be very rare for them to get lost and not be able to get back, or at least survive until help arrived. In David's latest movie, Missing 411 The Hunted, he looks at several cases where hunters have disappeared, either without a trace, or are found miles from where they were last seen. He also looks at why, in an unprecedented move, the FBI got involved in one of these cases. The film also features an exclusive account of a predator caught on camera, as well as actual recordings of some of the strangest sounds ever to be heard in the forest, that sent shivers down all of our spines and we're used to researching strange things like this. It's truly one of the most insane audio recordings I've ever heard in my life. All things that reinforce many people's belief that there is someone or something lurking in the wilderness that could ultimately be responsible for some of these baffling and unexplained disappearances. <laughs> 